Take your Bibles with me, if you would. And uh, we've been so blessed already in service just to worship and to watch Christ work in the way he has in the lives of others in baptism. Uh, let's get into the Word together. And if you open your Bible with me to Philippians, the New Testament book of Philippians, we're going to be in the third chapter. So Philippians 3. And as we turn there in the Word, today we're going to have an opportunity to begin uh, really a, a series of messages now through the month of June. And if we could appropriately identify that, it would be choose love. What does that look like in the Bible when it comes to love? Like love in what kind of way? What kind of area? And I want to get into what that's going to look like. Today, we're going to be focusing on what our love needs to look like in our fellowship with the Lord. And what that looks like in the scripture. And then next week we're going to get into choosing love and our compassion that we have uh, for people who are in need. We're going to get into a lot of things about that for the outreach ministry of the church as we move forward. And then the last message in that will be choosing love even when it comes down to our enemies. And how do you practice biblical forgiveness when it's needed? So we're going to be giving that as our focus for these weeks to come. Beginning today... With the foundation. Like there is no way I can give love if I don't know love. And the love is that God is love. Amen. And there is no love without knowing him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we give our attention today. Philippians chapter 3 is where we'll spend some time. Let's pray as we get into the word together. Father. I just pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that our hearts and our minds will just be still and know that you are God. And that, Lord, you would have our attention, that your scriptures would do the work that they do. And that, Lord, you would meet with us and that we would have that time with you right now. I pray, Father, that our love for you would grow and deepen beyond even what it is now. I pray, Father, that even in the services today, there may be some among us, Lord, that just don't even have a relationship with you, Father, who are lost and trying to figure out the cycle of life. And they'll never know true, no peace until they know you, Lord. I pray, Lord, today, your will is done. And I pray for all, all of us that know Christ, that, Lord, our love for you would be a time, Lord, where we can look and be honest with ourselves and with you. And that we could examine that and see if it is what it needs to be according to the scripture. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So what we have is an interesting background to this whole book of Philippians. But we're only looking today at the third chapter. And what we know about this is that there's a guy by the name of Apostle Paul in the New Testament who is the one the Spirit of God has inspired and empowered to write this while he's under house arrest in the year AD 61. He's writing to a church that is located in a city called Philippi. And as he's writing to them, much of the time when the Apostle Paul is writing in the New Testament, as God's Spirit gives him utterance, we find that in many of the times he's writing, it's with admonition, it's with rebuke, it's with correction. He, he always has something with which there's a firm rebuke to follow in many of the things you read. But when you get to Philippians, it's on a whole different level. This is a book here that is not necessarily about rebuke, it's about joy. In fact, this you could, you could say that Philippians is really just a joyful love letter that God moved in the apostle's heart to write to the church out of some things that deal with the fact that he knows there's a love that he wants to share. The word joy is used about 13 plus times in this book. And the joy that Paul had was really revolving around this one reason. It wasn't because of anything financial. It had nothing to do with what he owned or what was in his closet. It didn't have anything to do with who his friends were, what kind of reputation he had, what kind of job he had. Paul's joy was found in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's why he writes the way he does. In fact, he references just in four chapters, he references something to do with Jesus about 40 plus times because he is consumed by this relationship that God has with him through the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'll tell you why. In John 15, 11, Jesus made it clear. He said, these things I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and your joy might be full. This is where we are. What we know is that Paul's joy comes from this burning passion in his heart that is set on fire by the love, not that he has for Christ, but that Christ has for him. This is where it's at. Paul knew the reason why he was so stirred up with joy because he has not gotten over the fact of how much he is loved by the Father. And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ who would die for us in the way that he did. So the question that I want to ask you today is this. Just really get into this before we get into the text. When you look at your Christian life, and I look at mine, let's just take a look right now. Let's be totally transparent between us and God. The challenge that we find ourselves in is that we need to answer this question and answer it for real. Do you have a genuine burning passion for Jesus Christ? To love him, to know him. In modern day Christianity, we find that the more we give attention to that question, the more offensive it becomes. That's right. Because many times, many people want a relationship with God on their terms. Yeah. And they only want to love Christ as long as it's convenient for that person. And that's not the way that New Testament scripture preaches that. So where we are today is we've really got to identify, you know, where am I in my relationship with God? Am I, am I on fire for him? Am I, do I have a burning zeal for him? Do I find myself can't read? i, I got to have the scriptures in my life every day. Do I find myself wanting his word? Or is it just more of kind of like a... I'm just kind of casual. I love the Lord. And it's cheap talk because maybe it has no action to it. Right? I want to encourage you today to really listen to Philippians 3. Because I really know that what we find here in the scripture is that Paul lays this out for us in a way that we see what we need. And what we need is this statement here I want to say is that until we want Christ more than we want our next meal more than we want our next hobby, more than we want our next paycheck, more than we want our next breath. Until we want Christ that much, we will exchange fellowship with God for waste. That's right. Yeah. It'll just take one moment in heaven when we all pass away. And for those that know Christ, they wake up in glory. When we see him for who he is, yes. we will look back and say, wow, I wish I would have given more, done more, been more for Christ. Yeah, right. Because this is worth it now that I see him in glory. we got to see that by faith looking ahead. And where we are right now is that this, this waste is very real, y'all. Because the Christian life doesn't start off. It doesn't stay the same way whenever you get saved. How many of you know when you get saved, you come to know Christ? You find there becomes challenges and trials and difficulties, right? And it affects you. It affects me. We find ourselves going through mountaintops and down in valleys, and some days are better than others. And it's very, very easy to start cooling off in that burning passion for Christ. I want to say to you that today, if there's any of us that have chosen and we're really in a mess, it, it may be that we're just not where we need to be. It may be that the choosing love today, beginning with our fellowship with the Lord, needs to come back to that. Like a return back to Christ in a way that we say, Lord, I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be superficial. Like I don't want to read the Bible and then see my life and see that there's a disconnect here. I don't need to make myself something that I'm not. If your scripture says this, then I want that to be true of me and me not make up in my mind that I'm some other version of a Christian that you're just going to somehow accept. I don't want to water down the scripture, Lord. My Christian life means only what the scripture says it is. So today, if it is the fact that we've grown apathetic, if any of us are dealing with complacency, 
if we start casually coasting in our relationship with God and, and we're beginning to be a little bit lukewarm and we're like, man, I just don't burn like I used to. My zeal has just cooled off. I just need, I don't know what's wrong, but I need to come back. Remember the number one danger that happens whenever we start drifting away from the Lord is that the number one danger that happens, not number three and not number five or number two, number one is that unfortunate, shocking callousness that begins to happen. We begin to no longer be sensitive to the things of God like we once were. And before you know it, you hear somebody got saved and you just kind of say, oh, that's good. Versus when you're really close to the Lord and you're seeking His face, you're just so grateful that somebody doesn't know Christ. Yes. But whenever we're further away, it's just like the things of God just don't stir us anymore. Yeah. And that's where the reviving is needed. That's where we get back to this fact. So what I read in Philippians 3 is nothing light. I hear the Apostle Paul just pouring his heart out, giving to the church at Philippi what is needed to look like this. To live like this so that it doesn't look like we're living some fake kind of double standard life. But we're living a life that's really after Christ and nothing less and nothing more. So look at this text with me and I want you to notice some marks here of some genuine love for Christ. Not, not superficial, nothing that's surface level. Not like we're going through the motions kind of love. Like I go to church, I go home and I kind of do my thing through the week. And you know, I may or may not read my Bible, I may or may not pray, I, I, I may or may not... It's like none of these things are on our radar when we're casual. But when you're hot after his heart and you want to be all you can be for him, you'll find yourself saying, Lord, I'm consumed. I want more. I can't get enough. Lord, whatever you've got to do, break me. Bring me back to my knees. God, get me back where I need to go. Lord, I just want to be consumed with you. Lord, life is short. I don't know how many days I have left, but I know that I know you. Amen. And I want to make the most I can. For you, Lord. Paul gives us some marks. And the marks that he gives us here of genuine love begin with the mark of calculation. If you go with me in verse 7, look what he says. He says, but what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. He says this here, word, count, and gain, and loss, a number of times. If you might have noticed, Paul is using some terms here that we don't want to overlook. Paul is acknowledging his life before verse 7. He has been stair-stacking a number of things in his resume. He's been acknowledging that, man, I've been somebody. Man, if people were looking at my life from the outside, they would think I was somebody, that I've done some things in my life. And what Paul says when I look at all that stuff, and I look at all the way that I'm popular with people, and that people love me for what I've done as a Pharisee, he says, I look at that, and I look at Jesus Christ, and I say, every bit of that is dumb. All I see is Christ, and it doesn't matter what man says about me. Man can't get me to heaven one day. Yeah. Man can't save me. My reputation can't save me. I'm not going to go to heaven because of how good I've been. That's right. He says, none of these things are going to give me, so I count it as a loss. Preach. And I gain Christ. When we look at these things, the word count is used three times. The word loss is used three times. The word gain is used two times. In just these two verses, he has an interchange of eight different frequencies of these words. So Paul is bringing something home here. Yeah. He's trying to make a point. And he says, when I look at Christ, and the way that I love Christ is that I look at life and it is a mark of calculation. I have counted the cost. I have calculated that this is what it's all about. In Mark 8, Jesus made this statement. He said, when you, he said, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Amen. Or what will he give in exchange for his soul? The question every person's got to ask is that, what do I want to gain from this life? 
Don't want to gain this world. Don't want to gain all that I can get financially or materially or anything else with people and how they think about me. Or do I care more about gaining Christ? Yeah. Do I care more that he is who I'm after? I'm going to tell you something. When you love what you gain, you will love what you lost. Think about it. Right. When I love what I've gained in Christ, I'm going to love what I lost in my old life. I'm going to love that I lost what was keeping me an addict. I'm going to love what I lost in every broken relationship. I'm going to love what I lost in trying to be popular and trying to be nice or trying to be accepted by people. I'm going to love that I've lost everything that kept me a lost man. Yeah. But when I get in Christ, I love what I've gained so much that now I love what I lost. And if anybody in here who knows what it's like to be saved by the Lord Jesus and your life changed around, then you know what I'm talking about, right? Amen. You look at the old life and you say, thanks be to God who gave me a second chance and who loved me like I was when he found me. Amen. That's because of the love he has for us. I love the old hymn that says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus in, than houses or land. I would rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. Amen. I'd rather have Jesus than worldly applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I would rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. Than to be the king of a vast domain or to be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Amen. Jim Elliot made it so clear when he said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The mark of calculation of a genuine love for Jesus Christ. The mark of calculation is what we have. It's where you and I come to the point and say, man, I'm done with this work. I'm done with trying to find my way based on how much I own or who I am or what people think of me. I just want to gain Christ. I want to pursue him. Yeah. Everyone who has a genuine love for Jesus Christ comes to a point of calculating that I'm counting the cost. Everything is lost if it doesn't gain Christ. I'm after Jesus not after this world. There's another mark, not only of calculation, but there is the mark of confidence. If you look at verse 9 in your Bible, look what he says next here in the scripture. He says in verse 9, Paul says, when I gained Christ, he says, and he found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. When Paul makes the note here, I want to be found in him. Paul is acknowledging the fact that I've counted the loss. I'm done living for this world. I really have made up my mind. I'm not going to be a double-minded man. I'm not going to be trying to have a foot in the church and a foot in the, in the devil's playground. I'm going to instead say, no, I'm making my mind to say, I'm going to be serious about the cause of Christ. I want to go after Jesus. I want to witness to people. I want to love him. And Paul says, I've calculated it, and the calculation says Jesus. Amen. And so now, his, his, his actual confidence is that he says, you know what? The confidence that I have is that I have learned that I have no righteousness. And I have learned that only Jesus says the righteousness that I need. Here's what I mean by that. Righteousness. In the scripture, even in this Greek understanding, it just means this. It just means approved by God. That's all it is. Approved by God. It is the very doctrine of justification. It's where we understand what justified means. When God forgives us of our sin. And it leads us to now be accepted by God. What this means for Paul is that he's making a statement here, and man, is he on target. Because what Paul is saying is that I want to be found in him, look at this, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. Not having my own way of God approving me. Not trying to get my approval from God by the law, meaning by how much I can work for him. You see, Paul is making a note here because this is where many people are trapped. And it might be that maybe some of us are trapped in this. 
We're not a born again Christian yet. We are just one of those people who are trying to be good enough. Yeah. And we keep trying to do enough good, hoping our good outweighs the bad. Yeah. And then somehow our good outweighs the bad. If we die that way, we're going to be okay. That's, right. That's a lie from hell. Amen. That doesn't come from the Bible. That's what is made up in man-made philosophy. That's people's up. That's what people perceive God as being somebody who lets you in heaven based on your good versus your bad. No. Right. Paul is saying in the scripture here, I used to think my own righteousness would save me. But now I've learned that I have none. And my righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. So now I've learned that my righteousness is from Jesus Christ. And I stand only in his righteousness alone. I love what Paul said in Galatians 2 when he said, I have been crucified with Christ. Yeah. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Mm -hmm. And Paul said then, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. So today, this is where we are. When you love his righteousness more than your performance, you, your soul will quit competing and it will start confiding in Jesus. You and I will begin to learn what that really looks like in our day-to-day -day lives as we're focusing on the things that really matter the most. And so when you look at your life, and I look at mine, what is the love relationship like between you and Christ? What is it like between you and the living God of heaven? Have you calculated the cost? Have you and I found that our confidence every single day is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Let me tell you, there are going to be some days you don't feel very righteous. There will be days that you beat yourself up because you just didn't measure up that day. You made a mistake. You let your tongue slip. You did something to somebody. You and I made some mistakes, and therefore we think, man, that was not very Christ-like of me. There will be days like that. But what we do is we remind ourselves to pick ourselves up and say, man, it is never based on my performance. It is based on the fact that I am dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is the only reason why. I'm accepted and loved by God. That's right. It's because Christ has loved me with an everlasting, perfect righteousness. I love the old hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust in the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. And when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then and then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness, alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Amen. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. That's right. Where we are in this text is that we come to a point of saying, Paul, how do you love like that? Paul, how do you live like that? Man, it looks like that's like a super giant Christian. And then there's little old me over here looking at that apostle Paul going, man, I don't even come close. That's the problem. Paul was no different than you and me. The one thing that he did in the text here is what every single born again Christian is capable of doing. You know what it is? Completely calculate that everything I've gained is counted lost for Christ. I'm going after the Savior, the Son of the living God, and I'm going to give it all for Him. And I'm going to make no apology about it. I just want to chase Christ, and I want to be like Him because I've learned His righteousness is what I find my confidence in. So, Lord, today, I want to just walk with you and let your righteousness be what shines and lives through me. He counted the cost because there was a mark of calculation. There is the mark of confidence. And in the text, we also notice there's another mark here. And the mark here is of conformity. I want you to see what I mean by conformity. He says here in the scripture, look there with me at verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection of from the dead. When the Apostle Paul says this statement here, there's, a, there's something you don't want to miss, and here's what it is. Paul is just, you can hear the passion in him as he's writing, and he's saying, 
I've counted, them, I've counted the cost to follow Jesus Christ. And I've learned that his righteousness is all I need. I'm not, I'm not going to try to perform my way to God anymore. I'm done performing. I'm ready to live for Christ. And now, the conforming is what he's after. Here's what it is. That I would know him. He says, I want to be so close to Jesus. My love for him is that I would know him. That word know in the language was used intimacy. It was a referring to an intimate relationship. Paul is saying as spiritually close as a husband and wife can get, I want to get as close to Christ so that I can just be with him and love him and adore him and be faithful to him and have covenant with him. I want to know him. He says the power of his resurrection. I want the resurrected life of Christ to be living through me as I live my life for him. That divine ability to have God's power working with you when you go to the store, when you talk to people. That God's spirit is overflowing in you and then he says that I would have fellowship and sharing in his sufferings. That fellowship there is a word that meant partnership. And it's a reference where Paul is saying that I want to be so close to Christ that I know him. And that I have his power. And that I am looking at every day as a time to be in partnership. Jesus, where are we going today? Lord, even if it causes me to suffer, I'm okay with that, Jesus, because you suffered for me. So, Lord, today, what are we doing? I'm making big bubble. I may open my mouth and somebody doesn't like to hear about Jesus. And, Lord, if that brings reproach, then it brings it on. But your name is honored, Lord. Because I'm trying to reach people for your cause and your kingdom. And he says there, to be conformed to his death. The word there is a jointly formed conformity. He's saying, I want to be joined to you in such a way that I take on the same form of you. Yes. That's what he's saying here. In Luke 640, he says, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. When you love what you can become with Jesus, you will want to make changes and not make excuses. That's right. Yeah. And that's what we see. Paul is saying, I've calculated the cost. I have confidence that, man, no longer am I trying to be accepted. Nobody, not everybody's going to like me, and I'm okay with that because Jesus loves me. And I'm just going to be dressed in his righteousness and live out my cause for his glory. And while I'm doing this, I just want to be conformed to him. I want to be just like him. I want to know him as much as I can. And I want to be able to live by his power. I want to be able to overcome by faith. I want to be able to see that I can partner with Jesus in the ministry that he's given me to live out the cause. And I want to be conformed. And one day, the resurrection of the dead will come. And when I am raised with Christ... I will be giving God the glory and the praise. T.C. Horton made the statement. He said, you measure what you would do for the Lord by what you do. There is a difference. Many times we have plans to do things for the Lord, but we measure by what we would do by what we actually are doing right now. The scripture is clear about that in lots of different ways. Even Andrew Murray made the statement. He said, pride must die in you or else nothing of heaven can live inside you. Yeah. We just have to be willing to say, Lord, I want to be conformed to Christ in whatever measure it takes. Paul counted the cost. And he had the mark of the calculation. He had the mark there of confidence. He had the mark of conformity. But he also has, last of all, we see another mark in the text, and it's the mark of chasing. He's chasing. Let me explain what this means. He says in verse 12 in your Bible, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. He says, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Just one. One thing. Forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
When Paul is making this statement, man, sometimes the conviction just really wrecks my heart. Because I just, I, I look at my own Christian life many days and I say, Lord, I'm just, I'm so far from what this is describing. Yeah. And then there are days when it looks a little better. And then there are days when it doesn't. Yeah. And you just keep going, Lord, what is this supposed to look like? And here's what it is. Are you ready? It's a race. Yeah. It's just a race. And we're all in this race. It's called the race of faith. And according to the scripture, what Paul is saying, he says, I haven't reached this perfection yet. I may have had a good day, but I might have had five days bad before that. But I'm just keep striving. Just keep running. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't give up. Just keep on keeping on. And what Paul is making here is this term. He says, I press on. The word press on, it means a pursuit. It means to, they use it back in the Greek days to refer to the Olympics. And it was a run that you would go on to catch a runner in a race. I used to run track years ago. And, and I'm telling you, I remember those times and those races. There's nothing like that 1600 meter relay. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And there's people running around, you got that last guy on the race, and man, the crowd is going crazy. You're just cheering them on, and you can just feel the adrenaline. Even if you're sitting in the stands completely out of shape, right? You all of a sudden feel in shape when you're watching that race. I'll never forget those days. And when you hear what Paul is saying here, he's saying that. He's making that statement. I press on. I see a guy ahead of me. He's going to win. I keep running and try to catch him. I don't, want to, I don't want him to get ahead of me. I want to run there beside him and, and try to win the race. He says to lay hold. He says, I press on, look at that in your text, that I may lay hold of that for which also Christ has laid hold of me. The word lay hold is an interesting word. It means to take possession. It means when you seize a prize. What Paul is saying is that Christ has laid hold of me as if, he, as if I became his treasure. He saved me as a wretch. And now I belong to Jesus. And so he has laid hold of me as a prize. And so Paul, using this racing terminology, this running terminology, and that Christ has now looked at him as the prize, he says, I want to lay hold of that for which also Christ has laid hold of me. Jesus, if God became your prize, then I want you to become my prize. I want to run after you like you have come after me. The one who leaves the 99 sheep and goes after the one lost sheep, you know? Anybody been there? Yeah. That's the Lord Jesus here. Paul says, man, I was lost. Man, I was spent. I was going so far away. Killing Christians in the Judea area. And now all of a sudden, Christ met me on Damascus Road and saved me and transformed me. And so Paul is like, if you came after me and I became your prize, you love me that much, Jesus. I want to come after you the same way. The chasing is here in the text. In Acts 13, whenever the Paul, when the scripture said that God was looking for a man like David, a man after his own heart. When you love Christ, it becomes the hot pursuit chase to be just like him. When someone really loves Christ, you just want to go after him every day. And you just can't get enough of him. In John 8, when the woman was caught in adultery, Jesus looked at her and he said, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she responded and she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so what Paul is bringing out in the text is what that woman experienced. It's called forgetting. And what you find right there, look at this. He says, one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind. The word forget here in the language means to starve. It means to neglect something so that it dies. I forget the things which are behind me. Because the Lord knows everybody's got a past. Yeah. And sometimes our past is what holds us back from our future of what Christ wants to do in our life. But we never get to see what that is. Unless we learn what Paul learned. Who had a lot of things in his past that he needed to forget. Forgetting the things or neglecting, because some of us can't forget what's happened that's been wrong, but we can make a choice 
to love Christ and let that thing starve to death. Forget the things which are behind. He says, reaching forward to the things which are ahead. The word reaching literally meant in the running terminology, it meant to stretch. It was a stride. It was going in the race like this, going as fast as you can, as hard as you can. And you see what's ahead of you, and you reach, you stretch for it. This word here is a very aggressive word in that way. Yeah. Paul is saying, hey, if I'm going to forget what's behind me, the only way I can really change the momentum here is I've got to reach for what's ahead. I can't just drag my feet, just kind of wait a little bit here. I've got to go after it. And Paul said, that's the way I'm going to go. To forget the past, don't forget you're forgiven. We need to know that what you feed will grow and what you starve will die. Many times we have to move forward in that way of the things that are past us. A.W. Tozer made the statement, he said, to have found God and to still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. I've been found, but yet I'm still going after him. And how do you make sense of that? You just can't. I want to say to you today that wherever we are in this relationship that we have, the Lord Jesus Christ in Philippians 3 is paramount to the heart of the Apostle Paul. He doesn't look at his life as anything less than not some part-time Christian and then a part-time whatever somewhere else. He says, no, Christ has become everything to me. And so now the calculation has made it. Let me ask you a question. As we prepare here for this time of worship and this time of invitation, the question I just want to ask is this. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you're looking at your life like I've had to look at mine, and if you're coming up to a mathematical equation going, yeah, this isn't all really adding up. According to the scripture versus my life, these are really disconnected. I would just say to you, what's missing? Is that relationship that you need with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never been saved, know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Yeah. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. Yeah. If you don't know Christ, I'm going to be down here in the front. Uh, Brother Jared will be down here as well. And we're here to visit with you. If you just want to talk and you need somebody to pray with you, we're here for you. Yeah. But if you might be here as a Christian and you're like... Hey, you know what? My life as a Christian is not on track where it needs to be. Yeah. I look at my life with Christ right now, and I look at the scripture in Philippians 3, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm really not on track. I'm, I'm drifting. I want to come back. And I want to pursue Christ like he's been pursuing me. Whoever you are, just know this. The Lord hasn't forgotten you. He knows where you are in this race, even if you're way, way behind. Guess what? He's the great shepherd who doesn't leave, he doesn't leave his sheep. Yeah. He'll come right back to where you are and he'll bring you along. He'll help you. He just wants to know that you're calling for him. So wherever we are in this race, no matter how fast or how slow we're running, what matters is you're in the race and the Lord hasn't forgotten you. And he cares for you. So don't let the devil tell you otherwise. He loves you and he wants to help. If you need someone to pray with you, if you just need to pray this morning, about your love and your fellowship for the Lord. And let's have that time to speak with him about that, okay? Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And that even here today, you are able to help us and to sustain. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that anyone has need of you in such a way that they need help that they need hope today. They need to know, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are ready to continue to use them. I just pray, Father, that no one would write you off, Lord, and no one would feel like they're so far gone that there's no longer a fire that can burn them. Lord God, rekindle what you have started. Do the things that are of heaven. Do the things that are of your spirit, Lord. You work in the way that gives you the glory, Father. We love you, Father, and I pray your will is done. 
And may you all leave today with great hope that is found in Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray.